So, you're in for a real treat this evening. I am blessed to be able to welcome Jamie Bartlett to Virtual Futures. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and I'm the director of Virtual Futures. And for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim hidden behind the brushed steel, the silicon, the designer drugs, and the charismatic profits was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did was try to cast a critical eye over how humans and even non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This salon series, and it now has been a series, completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Tonight, uh, we're joined by Jamie Bartlett, one of the world's leading thinkers on radical politics and technology, and in his new book, Radicals, Outsiders Changing the World, it's a deep dive into the types of personalities that are drawn to reject social norms. It takes us inside the strange worlds of the innovators, disruptors, idealists, and extremists who think our society is broken and believe that they know how to fix it. No matter how wild their assertions or uncouth their visions might be for an alternative future, there's one thing that unites each of these uh, radicals, and it's the fact that their actions allow us uh, to have a genuine political debate, or at least force us to have a genuine political debate about some of the things that they uh, raise. So to help us better understand why radicals might be so important, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Jamie Bartlett to the Virtual Futures stage. Thank you. Thank you. So, Jamie, it all starts with a window, and that window is an Overton window. Could you explain the importance of the Overton window to this book, Radicals? Yes. So, well, first, thanks all very much uh, indeed for coming. Um, it's a really cool place, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah, wonderful. Oh, thank you. I have been working for a decade at this think tank called Demos, quite a well-known centre-left think tank. It was uh, very closely associated with the new labour movement. In fact, always considered to be Tony Blair's favourite think tank. And for a long time, I've been there for 10 years, which is a very long time for think tank years, a very long time indeed. And I'd noticed, of course, as anyone working in politics has, the sort of continual decline of confidence and trust in mainstream political parties, in our parliamentary democracy, in the justice system, media, almost every single major political institution of any note. And which is very annoying, really, because Demos was set up 25 years ago to try to arrest that decline. So we've obviously uh, utterly failed in doing that. But it was clear that there was, a, there was a, a, an appetite for people who had new, different, radical political ideas. Those were outside of the sort of centre-left, centre-right consensus that has dominated UK and most Western democracy politics for at least 20 years or so and so I set out to try to find them but before I could I had to define what that meant what is a radical I mean it's obviously a, um, a relational word so it has to be relative to something else and what is that something else the, is it the, the mainstream the currently elected political party and that sort of mainstream moves all the time of course so I thought, well, how am I going to define this? I kind of know who I'm interested in, but I do need a definition. And I found this uh, idea in political science called the Overton window, which is the it's 30 years old or 40 years old by an American political scientist who basically said there are a set of ideas that if you want to get elected in modern democracies, you basically have to sign up to these ideas. You can move around a little bit, but you all have to agree on some fundamentals about the importance of a mixed economy, a welfare state, managed migration, uh, law and order, the criminal justice system, policy towards drugs. They're all more or less, and you can 
play around a little bit at the edges, but essentially there is that consensus. So I thought, well, I'm, that's the Overton window. That window moves. And, and I want to find out the people that are currently outside of that window. So who were some of the people that you found? Who were some of the radicals that you went to go and explore specifically in this book? I mean, there's, there's an array of different types, whether it's political or, or, or sexual radicals. There's a massive an array of individuals that you went yeah. to go interview. Yeah, because, you know, everyone's obsessing over the far right at the moment or radical Islam in particular, those two things. But there, there's so much more out there. And I think we're entering into a great age of political turbulence where new political ideas from all across the spectrum or spectrums are going to become far more prominent. So I tried to cast the net really widely. So I looked at transhumanists, people who you obviously have a quite a close affinity with. Odd relationship uh, the, with the, them. <laughs> the future, I mean, essentially futurists who want to use science and technology to radically change the sort of human condition. Yes, I looked at radical right groups, but uh, psychedelics communities, uh, radical libertarians who are trying to create a new nation state. Beppe Grillo, the Italian a comedian who's actually not really that radical anymore because he's the leader of the single largest political party. Um, uh, a free love commune over in Portugal where a load of Germans live together. I looked at the UK's prevent strategy as well in quite a lot of detail about how, what the limits are of this sort of radicalism that a free society can take. And uh, spent a lot of time with the radical right as well, with Tommy Robinson, the former leader of the English Defence League. I followed him all across Europe for weeks and weeks. And so in each case, I was trying to find a slightly different type of movement. Oh, I forgot the radical environmentalists, of course. So each, I was trying to look at different groups each time, but always get right into them, you know, spend loads of time with them, almost live with them as best as I could. So that took me on psychedelic trips with people, but also into the Free Love Commune for a week to understand how that really was. Like I said, a week, some weeks and weeks with Tommy Robinson and the radical right, but also traveling across America with Zoltan Istvan, the transhumanist who was running for president on his massive coffin bus. So the idea really was to write an enjoyable book, essentially, that people would like to read, but contained within it were important political ideas. So we're going to talk about some of those specific examples later, but one of the things that I want to know is what is the value of radical thinking? Well, I'm really quite uh, a, a pessimist at the moment about the future of liberal democracy, frankly. Welcome to Virtual Futures. Yeah, all right, good, good to be here. We're in good company. And I've, I've just noticed that over the last five years or so, more and more people have felt this sort of sense of pessimism about where this is all going. And uh, and, 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 and to me, we are entering into an, an incredibly turbulent time, especially a sort of 20-year time horizon. All the stuff on what artificial intelligence is likely to do to our economies. And I don't mean marching robots killing people. I mean sort of the concentration of wealth and power into a small number of very um, big uh, technology firms and what that will do to democracy generally. Uh, obviously, the threats of climate change, which seem in the last six weeks especially to have really focused uh, the mind, but twinned with a generational decline in trust in democracy. And you look at those things together and I just think, my goodness, we are, we, we, I cannot see centre-left and centre-right politics as currently understood having the answers to these challenges. So where are the new ideas going to come from? Well, they're going to come from these crazy people on the fringes, aren't they? They always have done in the past. And they will stimulate us, I hope, to think about different problems, force us. I mean, Zoltan Istvan's a good example, forcing us to think about challenges that we may not have done, imagining solutions that we might think are a little bit crazy, but create a tiny bit more space for mainstream politicians to actually respond in a way that might work. So I just think they're, they're so important for the vitality of democracy. And even where you disagree with them, it's, they're really valuable. Because one of the reasons confidence in democracy has declined so much over the last 25 years is, is, a, is a sense of complacency about it. I mean, it's not, under th it's not under threat in any way. We've got used to it. But I think democracy does need a th a, some sort of a threat. It, to retain its vitality, to retain citizens who are alert to how you need to be active to ensure a liberal democracy functions. 
And radicals are just constantly producing challenges and new ideas to the status quo that forces citizens to respond. So to me, they're just they're absolutely vital. And things like the UK government's Prevent programme really worries me because it sort of points towards a society in which we all agree and we're all nice to each other and we all can conclude on a certain consensus about how things should be done. And that's the death of democracy because it's the death of ideas. And you use this word threat and I just wonder and you've touched on this a little bit in your book but I just wonder where is the line between say a radical and an extremist are they one and the same sometimes Do they share similar DNA or is there something very different about those two sorts of individuals no and the ter- the terms the terms are really uh, are often used interchangeably I think generally speaking historically especially in the 60s and in the 19th century radicalism had a more positive connotation. Obviously, the, 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 the early liberals who were radicals in the 19th century and then the 1960s social radicals, you know, that, that felt a bit more positive in a sense as a kind of pushing forward the boundaries of human freedom, whereas extremism has a, a sort of has an anti-democratic edge to it in the way that we talk about it now. So, I mean, it's partly just what you consider to be useful and valuable to, because, I mean, to me, radicalism was a more was a slightly more neutral word than extremism. I didn't like the word extremist because it does have such powerful connotations with extremist Islam. Where the actual line is in a free democracy, like to what extent do radical ideas, because most of the great dictators of history were also radicals in one sense or another, so at what point are they a problem? That's obviously an ongoing debate that liberal democracies always need to have. There's no answer to that. But to me, the line needs to be pushed a little further towards slightly more radical ideas rather than slightly less. But I, would, I could never say that there is an answer to that. I mean, I have vague notions that you know, the radical who kicks away the ladder so other radical groups can't express themselves or that removes the opportunity for free people to have other radical ideas is where I think it starts becoming unhelpful. But even that definition isn't brilliant because... You, you know, you, there's different ways you can interpret what freedom means to express your idea. I mean, do you think to a degree violence is the thing that separates those two, radicals and extremists? Because it feels like the radicals that you focus on in your book at least are very passive. And some, to a degree, where they're so passive, they're in these free love communes, the, the, the most extreme form of passivity. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the tr- I suppose you're right that the traditional liberal view is that violence is the line at which, at which you stop. Um, but there are different types of violence as well. I mean, there's there's fighting violence, there's violence against property, which the environmentalists that I spent time with uh, were, were quite happy to employ. So it's not strictly clear cut in that way. But yeah, I mean, that's a that's a pretty good. It's pretty. It's a good as good as any aligned. So it's the environmental movement, the extreme environmental movement that you went to meet. They're an odd example because what they're doing is kind of for the good and the health of the planet, but their means to an end aren't necessarily something we can all agree with. There's something tricky specifically about that example. I found the radical environmentalists to be very a very very difficult group actually for for several reasons. And I wrote an article for Foreign Policy last week, the week before last in which I suggested that radical environmentalism is the next wave of radicalization. Uh, They have a just cause, a a massive scientifically supported grievance that everybody can kind of, that everybody would benefit from them succeeding and they would have, I mean, I do not think that democracy will fix climate change. So to me, they will they will protest peacefully for a while and get so fed up and recognise that it's not working that some of them will turn to more and more extreme measures. And I think this is going to be the next big wave of radicalism that we as a society are going to worry about. And I fear we will treat them in the same way we treat ISIS and white supremacists. Lock them all up. They're all terrorists. And that would be a big problem because they're not the same. They don't really use violence in the same way at all. They would always try to avoid that, apart from the really, really radical fringes, like the Earth Liberation Front. And they're doing something that is sort of justifiably for the benefit of, of, of humanity. So it's a really, really difficult case. And I found it quite... I mean, and some, and some green activists who read this article were really pissed off with me for saying that because they felt that I had sort of put them in the same category as Islamic State 
by saying they're the next wave of problems. But I'm trying to I'm trying to say actually we need we need to be a bit smarter about how we define these groups. But the thing about the environmentalists that I found so infuriating, right, was that I spent a lot of time with the English Defence League type groups, the radical right groups, and a lot of time with the radical environmentalists. And I ideologically uh, I had a lot more in common with the environmentalists. But I would rather spend time with the English Defence League. <laughs> I like I know that's you're, you're really gonna have to explain that thing. statement. That yeah. is a really bad thing to say. And I found that tragic. Are the, are the EDL better drinkers? Is that why? Or is there something more nuanced there? Well, so the, the, the radical environmentalist groups spend so much time worrying about how they can create an inclusive environment to make sure that the movement is diverse, to make sure that people get involved with decision making and they use the Occupy style hand gestures and all of that stuff, um, and yet remain probably the most homogenous group that I have ever spent time with. They are all from the same background, the same university educated stuff, they talk the same and they dress the same. And it's really frustrating because they really are trying hard to break out of that. But the problem is, what they don't realize is that all of that sort of workshops on intersectionality and decision-making consensus also alienates so many people who turn up and just hear the language and look at the same people and think, this isn't a movement for me. Whereas my actual background is much more in keeping with people who are in the English Defence League and where I come from and my friends and stuff. So I immediately feel naturally at ease with people like that. And so and it, and it really made me understand quite how important those non-ideological cues are in movements. You don't just join them because you agree with them. You join them because you think they're people you can spend time with, that you could have a nice weekend with, that you can demonstrate with, and it becomes a way of life. And so that's infuriating because environmental activism is a real sort of lifestyle choice. The problem for them, and this is the tragedy that I write about in the book, is that when things get sufficiently bad, ordinary people will start joining the environmental movement. Ordinary people from across the spectrum. And you can already see it in the anti-fracking movement. You get old people, young people, working class people, everyone's turning up there because people in the anti-fracking movement are worried about their water supply in their town. Uh, that so, so, that, so it, it just naturally brings a very wide array of people together. So when you turn up at an anti-fracking movement uh, event, you get a cup of tea and a cake and how you're doing, and everybody's called like Maureen and Doreen and Tina, and it just feels really welcoming and quite diverse. And then you go to the environmental activist group, and they're obsessing over diversity, but with these really intricate workshops. And so the tragedy is that everybody, one day I think, will start joining environmental activist groups like they have with anti-fracking, when water levels are going up and, and the earth is getting hotter, and it's gonna to be too late. Like by the time that happens, it will be too late. And so I got so frustrated with it because I really, really want them to succeed and they're really good people. I just think they're going about it in a slightly unfortunate way. Well, let's talk about that growth of these groups. So you, you turn up to some of these groups and you're like, well, this feels like it's for me. This is a group I could be a part of. Do you think these radical groups want to grow? Do you think they, the final goal for them is to become, to a degree, mainstream? Or do they want to stay the big fish in small small ponds? Yeah, it's a good question, that, because I've spoken to other people in the environmentalist movement that sort of say that, you know, it's, you're kind of quite happy with having, I mean, quite happy with having something to struggle against. Yeah. And, 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 Got and something you, to do at the weekend. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. a little bit, yeah. And so uh, you know, certainly th there, is, there is a sort of, there's much more to these movements than just the proliferation of the ideas. There is all the kind of camaraderie that comes with being part of a movement and it's exciting and it's thrilling. And while, for example, the radical right and the anti-fascists say on the surface that they hate each other, they kind of need each other as well. I mean, in the same way that Liverpool and Everton fans hate each other. <coughs> But they, would, they wouldn't actually be that happy if the other side disappeared entirely. And I mean, with the, um, I know that sometimes the radical right and the anti-fascist groups 
communicate with each other before a demonstration to tell each other where they're going to be so they can smash each other's heads in. Is that, so, is that more to do with media attention? Is it the, the fact that they know that's what's going to get mimetic power? So they need a fight for the press to pay attention? Yes, that, well, that, that is definitely part of it. Uh, and it was with the, with the English Defence League. They were always caught in this tension between trying to go respectable like no fighting, no swearing, all of that, you know, we want to be we want to be a really modern, middle class, decent movement and realizing that a lot of people joined because there was fighting and drinking and chanting and 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 that's also what generated media which got boots on the ground. Uh, and that's certainly the case with Tommy Tommy Robinson. So there, there is there is an element there that some groups do like to retain some kind of exclusivity because it is a social thing for them. But there are others as well, of course, who some of them like, let's take the case of Zoltan, the transhumanist who ran for president uh, in the 2016 presidential election. He knew he was never going to win. I mean, the purpose was not to win that election. Could obviously. you explain for people who don't know some of his policies and what he was doing? Could you explain what Zoltan is doing? at least his aim and his goal and the means to which he went about trying to achieve that was. Because that's the last time we sat down. That was at London Futurists and you'd just come back off of the yeah, that's right. coffin bus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But just to say um, that his goal was to raise awareness of a movement rather than to necessarily win. So every radical movement does have a slightly different purpose, I think, and that dictates the tactics they use. Uh, but Zoltan gets in touch. I mean, I, Zoltan was in my last book, The Darknet, as well. He actually, like, rounded off The Darknet, my last book, and then started this book. Because he gets in touch with me in 2015 and says, I'm going to run for president as the, uh, as the leader of the Transhumanist Party. And uh, to get media coverage, um, I'm going to do it in a, in a, in a, in a 1977 60 foot long Wonder Lodge bus and I'm going to repurpose this bus and make it look like a giant coffin on wheels and we're going to call it the Immortality Bus and I'm going to travel from San Francisco to Washington DC and I'm going to stop off at loads of places so uh, to raise awareness about transhumanism i.e. that movement that I mentioned to, 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 where people I believe that you can and should use science and technology to radically improve uh, the human condition. And Zoltan, in particular, wanted to replace the military-industrial complex with a, with a scientific complex, whereby you would spend billions of dollars invested into anti-aging research to end aging in a generation. I mean, that was his main focus, was to end aging, to overcome death. And his pitch to the people was, vote for me if you want to live forever. Right. And he says to me, I'm going to have a drone on the bus and we're going to have like VR headsets and there's going to be a robot and there's going to be loads of other transhumanists yeah. and uh, it's going to be wicked. So I'm thinking this sounds like, amazing and it's like a beautiful first chapter for my book. So I travel over to, to San Francisco, turn up at his house in Merrin County and uh, spend uh, the, the following uh, Ten days on the bus with him as he. As but you didn't travel. see a you didn't see a transhumanist, extropian future, did you? You you ended up in a casino in Vegas. We, <laughs> we did. <laughs> via, via, via a biohacking lab, right. where Zoltan had an RFID chip implant put into his hand, so he could unlock his phone automatically with his hand like this. But. The chip implant only worked on uh, iPhones, and he had a Samsung phone. <laughs> so it didn't actually work. It was brilliant. But, um, but the, here's the thing about it, right? He, he's, a, he's a journalist. He worked for National Geographic. He understood very well what he was doing, and he understood that to get media coverage for what was obviously an absolutely ridiculous run at the presidency, he had to put on uh, an exciting prospect for journalists. And as we travelled across America on this bus, I mean, journalists absolutely loved this story. There were loads of journalists. There weren't many transhumanists on the bus, but there were loads of journalists. journalists. Yeah. Oh, journalists from all over the world were joining this trip. Because what is cooler for a, a, a journalist to write about a guy promising immortality on a 1977 Wonder Lodge bus with no air conditioning or heating, um, trundling across America? I mean, it's like the perfect story, and he knew that. And it created the weirdest dynamic. So one day we're in the Home Depot and he's, he needs to buy some paint 
to touch up the words immortality bus, right? It's a really boring thing to do. <laughs> Buy paint in the Home Depot, right? It's really just being q on a Saturday afternoon. But the difference is Zoltan is being uh, shadowed by a camera crew and like four journalists with notepads. Which means everybody starts stopping and saying, who so are, are you? Are you famous man? Are you famous? Who are you? Say like, you're famous, yeah, right? You're a rapper? Are you a rapper? Who are you? Oh, I'm right? Zoltan. I'm running for president. Oh, what are you? And it, and it created these scenes that we journalists then wrote about, like an amazing interaction Zoltan had in the Home Depot. But they only happened because he was being followed by journalists. So we, we were like creating the movement. And let me tell you, Zoltan's, Zoltan's bus tour was an absolute success. It was covered by every single media outlet, BBC, New Yorker, Washington Post, New York Times, Telegraph, Financial Times, De Spiegel, Daily Mail, everybody covered it. He was, it was absolutely remarkable. And here's the little kicker at the end, right? He told everybody, including me, that he was running as leader of the Transhumanist Party. I then found out later that there was no such thing as the Transhumanist Party. <laughs> he, had, he had created a political action committee, which is not a political party, called it the Transhumanist Party, and was running as an independent candidate, which anybody can do. It's really easy to run as an independent candidate. It's illegal under federal election law to raise money for a political party that doesn't exist, and he was doing that. Not one journalist checked whether or not there was even such an entity as the Transhumanist Party because we were all so enamoured by the idea of travelling across America. And he knew that. He knew that would happen. But he made a wager that it was worth it to generate coverage for this tiny fledgling movement. And he won that wager because even though a lot of transhumanists got really disgruntled with him, including the UK transhumanists, I don't know what your view is, but I'd like to hear it. Um, he still managed to sort of generate more coverage for transhumanism and some of the ideas than I think really anyone else has in the last 20 years. The thing with Zoltan is he ran a media campaign, not a political campaign. So the, the argument you could have for him is that he raised a lot of attention towards issues around science and technology, whether it was artificial intelligence and the issues surrounding artificial intelligence and technological obsolescence, or it was more nuanced and to do with the amount of investment that's placed in, say, the military in the US, but not in science, technology, and medicine. So he had some mimetic power there. I thought the whole thing was farcical from afar. I knew there was something very, very odd going on and of course the transhumanists just yeah, trying people, to find an excuse yeah, but, to be pissed off about anything yeah, but people so. didn't but journalists weren't writing about how farcical it was they were taking the whole thing sort of very, fairly very seriously. Seriously. they weren't investigating the actual detail of it which was quite important they were they were yeah they were kind of mocking it but it was it was part of the fun write-up of this ex exciting adventure so do you think radicals need this kind of feedback loop between people who think they're crazy or interesting or exciting and their kind of radical idea. Do you think radicals can't exist without individuals like yourself so interested yeah. in it radicals? Helps. It helps. It helps an awful lot. To I mean, like the the, we, the relationship between fringe politics and media, I think, is incredibly important. And I think we've seen it in some way with Donald Trump and with UKIP here and with other groups that there's a, a slightly larger than life interest in those weird outsiders that then kind of gets all the coverage that helps to sort of fulfill the prophecy if you like and I think that's um, that's what I was trying to explore in that chapter a little bit while simultaneously obviously falling foul of the very thing that I was describing because I was contributing it to it as well um, but he you know like I said I mean a lot of these movements to get some kind of cut through at the very beginning you do need to do these ridiculous stunts it really does help and there's a kind of switch moment where you realize you know what i don't care if everyone criticizes me and i don't care if everyone's laughing at me because that is the only chance i have right now of trying to get my ideas out there and he had, he had a perfectly legitimate criticism of the American political system, which is you cannot break into it. It's a two-party lock. 
And it's really frustrating for people that want to be activists or want to be involved in politics that they then have to go through this ridiculous machinery to become a candidate for one of the big parties. Otherwise, you've got no chance. So he saw that the only way for him to get his ideas out there really was to completely ignore all of that and go crazy and take this bus. So do you think the mainstream folks can learn something from radicals? I mean, folks were saying that people like Trump were radical, but Trump feels more like an opportunist rather than a than a radical. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, he's a difficult one for me. To, it's quite difficult to def, sort of define a, an outsider as a sort of multi-billionaire friend with presidents, but... He he certainly he he certainly played on the growing popularity of being an outsider, and and, and responded to the disenchantment of frustration that a lot of people quite legitimately feel, and so of course the mainstream can learn from the people who I mean the fact I mean the Democrats should really learn from the fact that a multi billionaire has somehow been able to position himself as a voice of the ordinary working American. Mm-hmm. And if they're not trying to learn from that, then what the hell are they doing? And I mean, some of the stuff that Zoltan was talking about in terms of how artificial intelligence will... I mean, it was, he, it was the first time I'd heard of universal basic income was Zoltan saying, you know what, we're going to need stuff like this. And I, I'm in favour of universal basic income. And I said, what on earth is that? What are you talking about? I've never even heard of that. You know, this was, this was nearly two years ago. But yet now it's something that serious academics are sort of really investigating, looking at and researching. And the first time, maybe that speaks badly on me, but you know, I think for a lot of people, they'd never heard of any of this stuff. They'd never even heard of machine learning or life extension technology until they read about Zoltan. So I think there is stuff that mainstream politicians can learn from these people, of course. Do you think these Again, back to what unites radicals, do you think they're trying to build a better future or do you think they're actually harking back to something in the past? Is it a degree of retrieval rather than a degree of radical newness? Well, some of the, I mean, one of the criticisms of my book, people have said, well, we've heard all this, free love communes, your chapter on free love communes. We had all that in the 70s. The radical right, they're not particularly new either. Transhumanism has been around for quite a few years as well, of course. Uh, but I don't think it. Ma- I, I don't see it in that way. I don't see it as necessarily looking forward to completely brand new ideas or looking backwards. It's people that are trying to do something different, and sometimes that is looking backwards. But that's immaterial to me, in a sense. What's wrong with looking backwards rather than looking forwards? I mean, at least you can see that way. Uh, you know, <laughs> you have lessons that you can learn from that. So, yeah, I mean, so a lot, a lot of these ideas aren't necessarily completely novel, uh, but they're definitely different. Do you think it, it's coming in waves almost? We have a running joke at Virtual Futures that we see the same thing every three to seven years. It seems to be the same wave. Do you think that's what you managed to hit yeah, in well, 2016? Just one of the peaks of the wave. Well, yeah, except that I don't think it's reached the top of the wave yet. I think it's going we're gonna, to gonna get a lot worse, uh, worse or better, depending on your worldview. But there's going to be a lot more different types of movements surging in popularity. And part of that is how new technology is changing things. But part of it, some of the trends I talked about before in terms of the big challenges we face, because I just don't see how we are going to deal with them. And it's going to become more and more apparent. And so people are going to be more and more interested in outsider thinking. You know, Paul, um, Paul Mason wrote about the sort of the wave theory of economics. And I thought to myself in his book, Post Capitalism, and I thought, I, I kind of got a similar notion that there could be a wave theory in, in democracies almost as well. It goes through great threats and turbulence because people get frustrated and bored and complacent with it. And then it's under threat. And then it comes around and people realise what it is and people fight for it and then it is healthy again. I mean, the level of trust and confidence in liberal democracy immediately after the war was very, very high because people really knew what it was that they'd fought for. And it's just gone down every decade since. And if there was another great crisis, I think it would happen and then it would go up again. But there's just not enough data because liberal democracies aren't old enough to be able to do that. But I, but I do have a sense that there is something in the wave theory, yes. And we might be heading towards a great period of difficulty and then people will kind of... The liberal democracy will, will sort of... will regain some vitality. So from democracy to technocracy, 
So your interest, at least most recently through your BBC documentary, Secrets of Silicon Valley, has been another type of radical that we've, we've seen in the past, the Silicon Valley tech CEO, possibly one of the most dangerous radicals, would you say? Okay. <laughs> um, I, generally speaking, I, I suppose the older I get, the more wary I am of a sort of utopian vision, the idea that technology will uh, solve all social problems, will fix man's <laughs> crooked timber. And, uh, and maybe that's just a function of getting over 30 and then becoming more and more conservative, as the old saying goes. Um, so that, I mean, just, so, I mean, ge generally speaking, yes. I think, just to take it back to the book for a second, but we will come back to the secrets of Silicon Valley if you, if you want. Um, I, the, the chapter I wrote on Beppe Grillo is an interesting example because that's another guy that sort of realized that the internet could have this amazing potential for new forms of direct democracy promising that we could get rid of political parties, that we could bring in people to make decisions on everything and it would be wonderful. And it reminded me of the, the early 90s when we were first entering into the great wave of digitization and, and everyone was saying, well, with digital technology, uh, democracy is going to be wonderful. It's going to be amazing. We, everyone's going to be so informed because everyone will have loads of information. And so we'll we'll get rid of misunderstanding because we'll have the information we need and nationalism and stuff and all of that. We'll get rid of that. We don't, that, that will be washed away. And it was such, it was sort of professorial hubris that everyone's like intelligent professors and they would all be very informed and knowledgeable and peaceful. And, and it's, it kind of seems a bit like a ridiculous joke now. But that was the view in the, in the mid-90s and I kind of remember it. I remember the amazing optimism about it. And so the idea that, you know, and Beppe Grillo is a, is a good example, that, that he believes that you can you know, radically transform and improve politics. I mean, Italian politics is particularly bad. So it, it's, it makes sense that it would arrive there. But at the same time, he has done what always seems to happen, which is loads and loads of power has been concentrated in the hands of Beppe Grillo and his tiny staff. While everyone gets to vote on everything on the blog that he runs, which is owned by a private company of which he is part. Uh, so it's amazing. Everyone can vote and everyone gets to have their say and they vote on the policies that the MPs will vote will end up voting on in the parliament. And the elected representatives from the Five Star Movement are chosen on this blog. All wonderful. But all of it run in a tiny office by a small number of people called the staff. No one knows who they are. They can boot you off the site whenever they want. They choose the questions that, is put, that are put to public votes. And so essentially, you've just created another sort of concentration of unaccountable power while promising to get rid of all of that. And so my kind of view is whatever technology we use and whatever promises we make about how it's going to be emancipating, human nature will in the end mean that people with power will accrue more power and you will create new unaccountable ways of power being held that you have to be constantly on guard for. And I think in a sense, that is what you have seen in Silicon Valley over the last decade or so. A lot of people being very excited about the prospects of the new information revolution, all the things you can find and see and connect to each other, but now a growing concern that there's new powers that people in other countries have that we don't really understand that have a huge influence over our democracy. Do you think there needs to be a retrieval to some of those ideas of mid-90s cyber culture? John Perry Barlow and, and said, look, governments have no place on cyberspace. Do you think we need to return to that kind of view of building a decentralized web in a world where what we ended up with was a very centralized web where all of our communication runs through the stacks of Google, Facebook, Twitter, or, or any other of those massive multinational yeah. That seems to now be the latest iteration, that we've created this central stack system, so you have huge power in those that own the servers that, or that run the servers, and digital technology tends towards monopoly-type practices, which is probably going to get worse as artificial intelligence so it gets better. And so now the big answer that everyone is proposing is a decentralized web, block, blockchain-based. We've got some blockchain-based people, not, not blockchain-based people here. That would be interesting. 
blockchain people here. That's where they want to get to, by the way. That's, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. A, a distributed person who is everywhere all at once. Or back to transhumanists. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, or, or, or new types of cooperative ownership over over platforms so to kind of change platform capitalism which seems to me at least to be more promising than let's nationalize something because then you have the governments holding these amazingly powerful tools but i i think we need to approach that with a lot more skepticism if we just all start looking at this in the same way we did in the 90s so it's going to be wonderful this is the technology that's going to do it this is the one the others were wrong but this time we're going to get it right i think we're somehow going to end up in the same position so I think we just got to be very, very alert to the tendency of those who already have technology to accrue or resources to accrue more power and the potential for new power concentrations to form whatever the technology is that we create. So I am I'm optimistic about this new wave. I think it's very interesting and exciting, but I am hesitant to rush headlong in and say this time we're going to get it right because I'm, I'm too much of a pessimist now. I feel we're getting very distracted with the cryptocurrency debate. Watching Ethereum go up and down, up and down, I think that's the, the worst thing that we could Is do. Is that because you have Ethereum and so you're no, watching it? No, I don't, Ether. but my buddies do, and I'm seriously fucking concerned that that stuff is going to crash and my buddy's going to lose 14 grand's worth of their savings. There's something, there's something discordant about the cryptocurrency space, but you spent time with the crypto anarchists. Do you think they might be onto something? Yeah, so have you guys heard of Liberland, this uh, country, well, sort of country, and <laughs> on the border between Serbia and Croatia, which is sort of a crypto anarchist paradise, a, a sort of a, a, a version of trying to create some kind of new nation state, but without, without borders, really. A lot of it will be run on a blockchain. Cryptocurrencies will be the currency. And it, the idea is that, for example, we become citizens of this new country. It's only seven square kilometers on disputed territory. The, the story behind it is amazing, but you have to read the book for that. Um, where you, um, let's say all of us together, like the, the whole idea of democracy is it rests on the consent of the governed. But we cannot go to a police officer and say, yeah, f I, d I, don't, I didn't actually agree with the law on drugs, so I'm going to opt out of that one. Uh, but don't worry, because I don't want to use the roads. I don't want to use the schools or the hospitals. So I'm just going to kind of be on my own and do what I want. Uh, you, you can't do that, obviously. And even if everyone in this room decided we were going to get together and uh, live together by our own laws, we couldn't do that either. There's no way of doing it. So the crypto anarchists, I mean, all radical libertarians really believe that democracy is not, does not guarantee liberty. All it does is forces a majority view on the minority. And in some cases, a minority view on the majority. So they believe that this place, Liberland, can be somewhere where you, you could, we could, there'll be no, vol there'll be no uh, forced taxation. It'll all be voluntary. We, if we decided, wanted to commission a little school of our own, could do that. And we'd use a blockchain to work out some contracts to do that. Uh, and we, only if we signed up to it voluntarily. And if we wanted to set our own laws, we could as well. There wouldn't, no one would bother us. And so like, this, to me, is a really good example of, of, of trying to be bold in imagining what the fundamentals are of a nation. Like, why do we live in a nation state? But like, why do we live in countries? I mean, everyone just assumes that that's normal, but it's not normal and it's quite new. And you need people like these crypto anarchists uh, to tr be pushing those boundaries because I'd never even thought about it. I just always just, I mean, just we live in countries and I live in the UK, you know, what's the. But, but being with them and seeing how they totally rejected that, thought the whole thing was a farce trying to imagine another way of doing it really makes you think about things, really makes you see the potential of things like cryptocurrencies as well. I, I want to qu talk very quickly about Secrets of Silicon Valley before I hand this over to our audience to ask you some questions. But there's always a feeling that the Silicon Valley tech CEO is such a radical, and I just wonder if that's false marketing. <laughs> there's cults of certain individuals in that space, and I wonder if that's why you were asked by the BBC to then go and meet the folks at Uber and Facebook and the folks who ran the social media campaigns for Trump. You know, these people think they're doing something ra very, very radical, but then they're answerable to their stockholders at the end of the day, and all they need to worry about is the current stock market price of their post-IPO Silicon Valley tech-based company. Um, I 
I, I mean, just I, I, I think that a lot of the a lot of the CEOs in Silicon Valley or the, the broader tech scene, because it also includes Los Angeles and Seattle. Mm-hmm. And so, if we use Silicon Valley as a kind of broad term for that. A lot of them really do, they are real believers. You know, they do, especially at the beginning, they do start off with this real belief that you can use technology to solve social problems and, and, and make money, but, but, but to solve social problems. And I, and I think someone like Mark Zuckerberg really, really believes, well, we're very cynical about him and Facebook, really believes that connectivity is going to solve loads of social problems. And it in itself is a good, it's a social good. I think the the what people forget about Silicon Valley though is what is that people go there not just for the the tech startups but because of all the venture capital money and that pours into these companies early on they suddenly have this like unbelievably difficult growth targets that they have to meet and it's always about growth rather than necessarily profit because investors want to see rapid growth because someone like Peter Thiel another big investor of course has is one of those who says you're you're kind of aiming for a monopoly position in a marketplace like like Uber, um, and so suddenly you have all of this like unbelievable pressure on you to deliver astounding growth levels, and then that that essentially puts a kind of traditional capitalism on top of your idealism, and I think in the end the traditional capitalism wins, which is growth and profits, cutting costs you know, trying to constantly push into new markets. And they, they benefit, of course, from often not quite fitting into existing law. I mean, Uber and Amazon to some extent and Facebook and Google, they don't easily slot into existing legislation in a lot of countries. And so they're able to kind of exploit that grey area so that they can grow quite quickly. And someone like Brian Chesky at Airbnb has said in the past, you, you kind of want to either be very, very small, so you go under the radar, or very, very big, so you're too big to kind of shut down. And the kind of rapid growth curve is to get from the very small to the very big very quickly. And that's what, I mean, that's certainly what Skype uh, did as well. Uh, so <clears throat> to me, I think we've, there's, there's an awful lot written right now that's critical of the big tech firms. It's weird how in the last year, I think it's become so much more fashionable to write sort of critical articles about all of them I think it's a little bit more complicated than just they're all a bunch of mad capitalists and they're using the language of progressive idealism to cover that up I think the two things are slightly more enmeshed do you think the response to that is smaller radical groups so the things with regards to platform cooperatives and smaller groups creating their own little local currencies and it's a small group of individuals and it's a currency that doesn't translate across national borders and the way in which blockchain wants to be the currency of the entire world do you think these smaller radical groups and multitude of these smaller radical groups multitudes of different way of, ways of living is the possible future that you're exploring or the possible response to the idea that we're just going to homogenize everybody under one singular umbrella and the internet will be facebook and the currency will be block uh, bitcoin I, I hope so I really, really hope so. I think we need many more experiments in living together. Uh, the danger, I think, is particularly with the platform cooperatives or the other innovative new ways of doing it, of course, is that some of the bigger tech firms can buy them out quickly yeah. because that's also now part of, of the model that you would buy out competitors. So that's, also, that's obviously a danger, and that's one of the reasons people are very wary of monopolies generally. So forget whether they're platform-based monopolies. Any monopolies in an economy is a problem because they're able to then buy out competitors before uh, they, they're able to compete fairly. So that's a danger. But, I, but, I, but more generally in terms of sort of social experimentation, John Stuart Mill, I always seem to manage to quote him at least once in a talk because he's, I mean, yeah, uh, he's the, the lazy man's philosopher. Um, he, he said that we, we need experiments in living because that's the only way we can ever kind of learn how to do things better by having lots of different people trying lots of different things and looking at it, learning from it. Uh, and that's why I, I, I hope it tends towards much more exciting experimentation. And a, a very, very basic, boring demos think tank approach would be way more power for cities or local authorities to play with their own laws 
or in all sorts of ways and their own taxation and all and then beyond that stuff like the free love commune that i i stayed on much more of those small communes and communities that are so kind of self-governing trying things working things out uh, much more of that we need it almost feels like in the last three or four discussions that we've had here at virtual futures we had adam greenfield um, here just before before your discussion we had douglas rushkoff it feels like we're moving towards some sort of subspeciation we'll let elon musk and his buddies fly off to mars those guys can go live up there we'll have some of the free love communes over in portugal we'll have some people living inside of computers the transhumanists somewhere in silicon valley and maybe some of the russian cosmos do you think we're going to see such of a massive split in that way and we're going to see a move whereby it's no longer left right politics but it's up down politics where it's either you live in a community that's very techno progressive and you're hanging out on mars with elon or you live in a community which is you know not regressive per se but borderline luddite where you're living in kind of a free love commune and that's okay too that's an acceptable yes. way to live right so anti radical anti-technology movements will almost in my mind almost certainly in the next 30 years be uh, be be a pretty significant movement. I'm so, I'm sure of it. Maybe twenty twenty years, mm-hmm. um, but that's an aside. Uh, I I would hope we can get to that. But the danger is the nation states or the way we live now won't go down easily without a fight. So you will see a great kickback against all of these ideas. There's no doubt about it. Uh, taxation is going to get harder to raise. Uh, law and order is going to get harder to enforce. Nation states will have to try and work harder to keep those things running, which means that dissent will be cracked down on much harder, which is which is a great worry to me. So while I, I hope that that is where we end up, I don't think it's going to be an easy ride, no. So on that wonderfully positive note, uh, we're going to open I, You know what? I am sick of being positive about things, right? When you go and do talks at places... Everyone wants you to be positive, especially no, when you go and do not, we, not, not you, not you. Person. But but like, especially when you go and do sort of commercial talks or companies, they want you to finish on a really positive note. And so every commentator has an incentive to be really positive, and I think that's quite dangerous because mm-hmm. I think it's quite important to be pessimistic because it might guard against some of the things that <laughs> that are coming. And we're all we're all. <laughs> You're all pessimists. No, we're all masochists in this room. That's that's, that's what we really are. Um, We do have a microphone. If you have any questions or if you have any solutions um, on how we're going to live, we're going to jump this around. Racy, thank you ever so much. Um, Does anybody have any questions? Oh, just here. Makes life easier. Um, So I was wondering um, if you see any uh, potential problems emerging with the radicalization of identity politics movements, um, which seems to be encouraged by mainstream liberalism at the moment for the ultimate project of the progressive left in a kind of universal sense. Okay, I, I am, I'm no fan of identity politics. Um, I think the internet has played quite a big role in encouraging the growth of, uh, of identity politics. Um, the reason I don't like uh, it is twofold one i think it just it feeds off itself so it creates other forms of identity politics as well and so you just have lots and lots of competing identity politics which is not actually uh, it's not actually helpful for sort of a collective sense of shared purpose and that's a great that's a great concern to me because people the the narrower and narrower you define your identity, the harder it becomes to be able to work together with other people. A very broad level, the U.S. Um, Congress is more polarized than it's ever been, and, and that's not just identity politics in the traditional sense, but I mean left-right identity politics. And and so and I think the internet has played an important role in fueling that, and and I, and I can't see any obvious ways that that's going to get much better. And I know from spending a lot of time with groups, the radical right, the Tommy Robinsons of this world, they are co- they are being fueled by the identity politics that they see from the other side. And they think, well, how comes Black Lives Matter gets to do all this? What about White Lives Matter? Right, let's go chanting about White Lives And then another group, and, and it just kind of feeds off itself. And, and while I can understand the frustrations of, of people that sort of, through identity-based politics, 
are finding a political voice and you want to welcome that, I think there are negative consequences that that maybe are not commodious for the, the overall goal of a more kind of progressive, open political uh, debate. But the other thing that worries me about it is, I mean, I think representative democracy is, is in pretty terminal decline. Um, and that is also, I want to say the fault of the internet, but the internet is, is part of the reason for that. And representative democracy, in this country at least, is premised on the idea that somebody other than you can represent you and your interests. And the narrower and narrower your identity becomes, the less and less you will believe that someone other than a person that shares your identity, whatever identity you have chosen, will be able to genuinely represent your interests. How, how can representative democracy work in that way? It'd be very, it's very hard to imagine it. So I think that's part of the reason that confidence in democracy is declining. So the result is going to be more and more direct democracy. We should have our say directly. That is going to make politics, in my view, more angry and more polarised. And I hate to like say that maybe Plato was right about democracy, but he said he hated democracy. And he said, democracy, the problem with democracy is it prioritises opinion over knowledge and kind of emotions over intellect. And that's what kind of worries me. So I think representative democracy is really good, but I think identity politics fundamentally undermines it. There's almost a legitimate hope that aliens do land, and that way we can start looking at each other all as humans again, and not as separate, separate individuals. Well, maybe that's an interesting point in a sense that big, like very major crises, could the things that I'm worried about that are coming could be the sorts of things that will unite people together in a struggle and through some suffering. And that's a horrible way of looking at it. But I think that is actually, unfortunately, one of the things that might help things like representative democracy. It sounds like we're heading to an episode. It sounds like we're heading to a Mad Max movie in, sooner or later. Um, I haven't actually read the book, but I'm, I'm very interested in doing so. Um, I'd like you to uh, address the idea of those kinds of organizations other than just or even post-crisis then if if the apocalypse occurs and we suddenly manage to organize in some way um if it's not a, a representative government that could come up with another way of doing things and it is these experiments in alternative living that are required to come up with other ways of doing things um it took a government funding to set up a darpa to come up with other ways of doing communications and often you'll find uh Lifestyle experiments are either a cult leader or a particular rich fanatic or a particular specialist group that can establish that space to make that experiment. What other kinds of organization could set up or attempt to experiment with radicalism? So I think my view on, on radicalism more generally, and bear in mind that I was just trying to tell these stories. It's really interesting, right? So the last book, The Dark Net, was a load of sort of human-led stories about weird internet subcultures. And everybody just wanted to know about the people. Oh, who are the tro what are trolls really like? And what are cam girls really like? And what's it? Um, and this book was the same. It's all about people and experiences. But uh, political climate's changed. And everyone now wants actual answers, like your question. Like, what are the things that we can actually do that we can try? And I fear that I don't really have great answers to that because I've focused really on stories and motivations and events that people have had, sort of introducing their ideas as well, but kind of non-judgmentally. Um, I'd say my main thing, I mean, there is a, there is a, that the commune that I, I stayed on, the Free Love Commune, is an example. I mean, that they are kind of gearing up for a post-apocalyptic survival. And they're completely energy sufficient, food sufficient, uh, water sufficient. And, you know, if, I, if anything went wrong, I'd be turning up there, begging them to let me in, because I don't know how to do anything. Like, I can order an Uber, but I don't know how to get, like, clean water. I don't know how to do anything. It's embarrassing. And I think that's quite causes some kind of tension or sadness inside. Uh, they won't let me back in, though, because they don't like the chapter I wrote about them. But anyway, <laughs> so I'm screwed. But, um, but they are kind of geared up for that sort of post-apocalyptic meltdown and in a way that sort of makes some sense. And it's interesting that in the, the last big wave 
of alternative communes in the 1970s was in response to fears over a nuclear, nuclear war. There's more intentional communities is the correct term for it. There's more intentional communities been set up last year than any year since the 1970s because people have been driven by this kind of existential fear about how the world is going or just wanting to go off grid and kind of try and live in a different way. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in all of those. I think they, are, they do offer quite a, an exciting model. You do always need to be wary of the cult leader and the financial misconduct because most of them collapse because of one of those two reasons. Um, this one hasn't because of the free love aspect. It's fascinating how they've done it. But they can't get bigger than 120 people. They've been trying for like 20 years to grow beyond 120 people. And the reason they can't grow beyond 120 people, it's quite a famous number. 120 to 150 is known as Dunbar's number. You know the names of everybody and you know the relationships between each person. And apparently humans can't really live in communities bigger than that without creating huge hierarchies, which is exactly what those people are trying to get away from. So you have this problem of scalability with these, with these communes, that they, which, which is what made it such an interesting model. That actually, 120 is kind of the natural size that you can live at in a commune in that kind of a place. The problem is to live in a modern commune with most of the kind, like reasonably good level of living, not with all the modern technology we have, would take about between 500 and 1,000 people sort of reasonable medical care and all the rest of it. So we're kind of stuck between 120 and 500. But sorry, that is a really long way of saying that the value that I see, because I work for a think tank in these radical movements, is not necessarily creating a movement that would suddenly take over and give you the answers, but stimulates mainstream political parties, which I still think are the best way of governing society, into being a bit bolder in the ideas that they have and the policies they propose. Any other questions? Pat. Yes. Nice hi, uh, hi. Um, my name is Pat Kane, and, and I'm part of, with uh, Indra, I'm part of something called the Alternative UK, which is trying to curate these experiments and living that you're talking about. I just wanted to ask you a really simple question about UBI, Universal Basic Income, and what you think of it. Because psychologically, it works, as in it gives people a sense of security, it raises their floor of security, so therefore they can cope with difference and the difference other people's experiments are living because they feel as if they're not so panicked. But in terms of this scenario, your pessimistic view of politics going forward, you know, it seems to happen what in a, in, a, in, a, in a region, in a town, as experiments, and then nations try it out, but they don't try and then it happens at a European level, and then it happens at a global level. So just, just what do you think? Because UBI is obviously across left, right, a bit, a, a beloved idea at the moment. The moguls like it because it cuts down bureaucracy. The t socialists like it because it redistributes. What do you think about it? Is it, ma is it a bit magic thinking? I, I had the, 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 in the Secrets of Silicon Valley sort of a, a sort of debate with Sam Altman who runs Y Combinator about universal basic income because he uh, he's sponsoring some research into it. And certainly in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of interest in it because I think they also see the long-term potential of the technologies they're building to disrupt employment. So forget for a moment all of the, is it affordable? And but just on a purely sort of hypothetical level, I, I, I think we have not really thought through um, what it would do to sort of human psychology, I'm afraid. Like the idea that we would have lots and lots of potentially bored people I mean, like, boredom is one of the things that I think we really don't talk about enough as a driver for radicalism and crime and all gang involvement, a need for adventure and for purpose and for doing something. And I think the people that come up with these schemes, uh, they genuinely believe that everyone would be a poet and would be creative and, you know, they would knit and they would, you know, and they would write music and, because that's what they do. But I'm not sure that's what a lot of people do. And so I would be worried about the creation of lots of potentially very bored people, which for a long time, for hundreds of years, the sole purpose of education and the military and everything was to keep young men from being bored, essentially, to stop them from revolting. Uh, so that's a, well, one great worry. The other, I think, would be um, a deeper sort of feeling that you were reliant so much on some kind of 
state aid. Now, even though universal basic income is for everybody, there still would be people who wouldn't need it as much as you would. And there would, if we got to a point in which we had it, there would be some very, very rich people at the top who were clearly running a lot of the big technology companies and so on. And that level of sort of inequality of purpose and agency, I think, would be as important sort of and frustrating for people as inequality of as well of wealth and income but i think it's definitely something that is worth experimenting with like i said i mean i keep saying we've got to try and experiment and that is one thing that we need to start experimenting with now and if the uk has an industrial strategy post brexit and it's all about pushing technology and artificial intelligence and machine learning it needs to include ways that it might deal with whatever social turbulence could come with those technologies, including universal basic income. Someone suggested to me the other day that universal training income might be slightly better. Given that we may have to retrain a lot more for our jobs, and something like 40% of all jobs might involve some interaction between humans and computers or machine learning intelligence, um, we are going to need to retrain more often. So we should have a government-funded universal training income rather than a universal basic income. But it might be only for one or two days a week rather than all the time. So I, I think there's actually quite a lot of scope for, for working that through. But we're, we're at the foothills, aren't we, about what's possible. And you've got to start somewhere. And I think it's a good way of starting. But they're the things I would be looking at. I would be looking at those questions as much as I would how are we going to pay for the revenue for all of this. I mean, especially if like some of the big tech firms aren't paying taxes. Mm -hmm. Who's going to pay for the universal basic income in the first place? So aside from those questions, I think we've got to think about the psychological ones. And, and that's, the, that's the massive joke. The employees at Google advocate universal basic income, but Google doesn't pay their taxes to actually allow that to occur. I mean, there's been some interesting arguments that have been made going, look, maybe it's not a universal basic income that's given to us by governments, but the things that we do on an everyday basis to produce data that then can be sold, i.e., trolling through our social media, looking at social platforms, engaging and clicking, we should be paid for that. Maybe that's the thing that we actually get in exchange yeah. value from, say, Google or Facebook. They're able to take our attention data and pay us for it. Pay us to watch the fucking ads. Pretty depressing view of what's possible, though, isn't it? I mean, like, we should get paid for scrolling through stuff that we, well, we do it anyway. Family. If we do it anyway, yeah, we I know. Get bloody no, I, paid for it. I agree, I agree, but you know what I mean? It doesn't feel like it's, it really lifts the human spirit as an idea. But, the, <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> but I think that you're right. I mean, I've always had this thought that, you know, the co cooperative platform model, which is where there's some kind of, you know, shit dividend for the users who are the owners of a platform, a cooperative model, uh, would probably work pretty damn well. I mean, I don't see a massive problem with that. And, uh, you know, with companies that have unbelievably high advertising revenue, it seems, stands to reason that some people could be paid something for the contribution that they put in. The problem is, how do you break the network effect? Mm -hmm. We, like, all flock to the same small number. Of, this, is, this, is, this was the great myth. And actually, Douglas Rushkoff admits that he was also guilty of it. Oh, the internet is going to just make everything decentralized. and It'll all be peer-to-peer, -peer and it'll be brilliant, rather than realizing that there would be a great concentration in one or two companies because everyone would flock to the same ones because they were better. There was more stuff on them, which would bring more people, which means they'd get better, and so on. And so the question for the cooperative platform model is how can you break the current network effect monopoly that these companies have from a standing start without then being bought out as well so again possible we can experiment we can try models i think people will uh, and we want to watch them closely but it's going to be difficult it's to a degree it's to keep the entropy in there to make sure it's physical human people that have to be in one singular space and the platform cooperative model is based on the fact that everybody lives in the same environment as opposed to their network connected and are collaborating and sharing their, their skills and they, expertise. But they already exist, don't they? I mean, there are these models and there are ones in the UK. I mean, there are versions of Amazon, there are versions of eBay. I'm not sure about Facebook or Google especially is very, very difficult. But, but you know, I mean, I wonder whether or not at some point people will make the judgment that it's kind of a... Formal politics isn't working so well, but small political gestures include which platform do you use? Oh, I'm buying fair trade. I'm going to I'm going to use the platform capitalism, uh, sorry, cooperative version of Amazon. I'm going to pay a little bit more for that, but this is a political gesture in the way that I buy fair trade stuff. 
And I wonder whether or not that might be part of the stimulus in the next few years, that these small gestures are seen as political, in a sense. And I encourage you to, to go and talk to Pat about what he's doing, specifically with the Alternative UK, which uh, harks to some of that. Do we have any other questions at all? Yes. <laughs> it's just the alternative groups. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Hello, Indra, also of the Alternative UK. Um, I, I'm, I'm enjoying everything you're saying and recognise a lot of what you're doing, but I've got a question. Um, I mean, we publish a daily alternative. So every single day we're picking up another initiative, another way of people gathering, another way of people finding agency in the world, right? All social political um, initiatives. There are many. And on our platform, we do have you know, the flat pack democracies who are creating new technologies of democracy at the local level. But we also have, you know, everything that Luke's doing, virtual futures, London futurists, you know, we have, a, you know, as much futurist exploration as we can. I'm just a bit puzzled that you don't think these things can come together because there's every sign that they could, you know. So once you have relationships established on a human level, uh, why not import, you know, these new technologies why not import ai and buy i mean there's 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 an interest in them as soon as there is a sense of autonomy ownership and agency, then you know the technology can be used uh, to create to create new kinds of value and, and, on, and on the same point i'm a bit puzzled that you would encourage people to go to the old political parties to try to find these new ways forward i mean it's only two percent of people in this country are members of political parties Right, two percent. I mean, that the whole discourse, you know, is around that conversation. Um, whereas it's the new political parties, the new forms that are, you know, more interesting, like uh, Alternative in Denmark or um, Five Star. I have a different story about Five Star than you do. You know, what I see is that they've got, uh, you know, genuine politicians trying to make a change in Parliament, but it's very difficult to act with. You know, you can be a new politician acting within an old culture and you're not going to be able to deliver what you promised your movement. I, I, what I'm seeing is not that they're, uh, you know, becoming power crazy themselves, but they simply cannot deliver. It's, it's quite a suffering for them trying to work within that old culture. So a new political party, you know, what a new idea of a political party surely is going to deliver much more than trying to keep trying to change these old, uh, you know, 2%. Two percenters. Yeah. Well, two percent might belong to them, but you know, still sixty or seventy percent of people vote for them. And I agree with you, like they're clapped out and tired. But I just mean in terms of how how I see the most likely way that these radical ideas might change things, from my perspective, is that they hopefully will stretch out what mainstream parties will consider. That's just how I see the most likely way of it happening. Um, I agree with you about Beppe Grillo. I mean, in the book, I do I talk about the great positives. I mean, the fact that it's totally, I mean, it's brought in hundreds of thousands of new activists. These amazing new meetup groups dotted all over the uh, over the country uh, transformed the gender and age balance of the Italian Parliament. Loads of brilliant things that it's done. But I just I just put in that pessimism or that cynicism about the idea that it solves the fundamental problems of politics or it doesn't create recreate some of the same problems again in slightly new forms and so my hope for any new movement is to have those sort of problems at the forefront of their mind when it comes to things like can we get this sort of mass sudden take up uh, of new technology and it can really sort of it can lift up I mean that there, there is of course the possibility that those sorts of technologies benefit from the same network effects that have resulted in Google and Facebook becoming so big which is that suddenly everyone starts going on to a cooperative or a new form of you know what some kind of new form of organizing and then more people go because there's more people on there and it just suddenly quickly imp increases and i and i made the i made the argument about that with the dark net about the tor browser and i said you know the same thing happened with the world wide web in 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 1990 1991 uh, no one was on it and then suddenly, because some people were on it, loads more people joined. They built very cool websites, which meant another 10,000 people joined. And they built be better websites. And the whole thing just started growing exponentially. And I said the same thing could happen with the dark net, with the, with the Tor browser and the dark net. And it didn't. And it just, I mean, and it just didn't because 
it's too slow and people and there wasn't the, there wasn't the massive corporate investment into making it efficient and fast and slick and a lot of that had originally come from the US government and now it's being run by private companies and so you, you know to, to me I think there is a possibility of that I just think that it's helpful to bear in mind some of the basics of of what people are after so when it comes to things like exciting new cooperative platforms everything we know says people now demand efficiency and speed when it comes to internet connection and decision making like everyone who works for the Tor Foundation thinks that people will trade that for extra security and they won't mm -hmm. not enough people will so the task for the Tor Foundation and anyone involved in encryption and I'm just using this as maybe an analogy um, will be to make encryption default unbelievably easy or as fast and convenient as Mozilla or Internet Explorer and then it will benefit from those network effects and it will, because everyone will use it because they'll be like well, why would I use Google's or Internet Explorer or Chrome rather than Tor I'll just use Tor it's exactly the same so Tor's challenge is not always about improving the efficiency or the sorry it's not about improving the security of it anymore it's about making it really easy to use and fast and so that's the kind of logic that I'm trying to look at with these problems. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but I mean, that's basically the way I, I see the sort of mass adaptation now. Sorry, mass adoption, not adaptation. It, it's almost, they want to become Web 2.0. And that's the feeling with the, the at least the Ethereum folks, some of the Ethereum folks, they're using language of Web 2.0 to almost cognitively trick us into believing it's kind of the same. They use words like dApps decentralized apps. They've co-opted all of this language that we're used to from Web 2.0 to build Web 3.0 instead of doing something which at least I would consider radical, which is burn Web 2.0 down and start again. As John Perry Barlow said, look, the internet isn't a construction project and yet it's become a construction project. So at least to me, the most obvious thing to do is a demolition project before we start on the next thing. Maybe, but I mean, to go back to the last woman's point as well, um, the, with 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 modern technology, the speed of adoption can be unbelievably fast. So a very small project, you might have lots of different projects taking off, and you don't know quite which one's going to really pick up. And sometimes, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg said that Twitter was basically what do you say, like a, a a car full of clowns that actually accidentally drove into. He has this amazing quote. I can't remember what it is. But basically, they didn't really know what they were building or what they were doing. They just landed on this idea, and it somehow just took off way faster than any of them had imagined. And so I think the, one of the good things about the stuff that you're doing is you have all these different experiments going on, and one of them might just suddenly take off like that and just get picked up by everyone. I mean, because things, you know, a lot, I mean, a lot of the technology, I mean, stuff like Snapchat, I mean, it's so, it was so yeah. new. You might hate it, and it doesn't really matter, but the point is, it's so new, no one had imagined it, the guys that invented it probably never thought it was going to be anywhere near as big as it became. Mark Zuckerberg certainly didn't with Facebook, and yet it did. And so it will happen again, which is why you probably need to have lots of these experiments going on with different ways of doing stuff, um, knowing that a lot of them will fail, but a small number of them might succeed and become absolutely enormous. And at that point, you've got to be aware of the dangers of replicating the same model with venture capital and with new concentrations of power and new people again with power getting more power. And I think that would be a, that's my optimistic view on that. There's a bit of optimism for you at the end. Question just here. Hi, thank you. It's probably um, quite a pedestrian um, question, um, but I'm wondering about uh, like the human mind. And so, for example, you're writing about radicals, and this is probably not to do with the free love German people in Portugal, but uh, particularly when it comes down to individuals. So um, I'm wondering how much something like sociopathy might actually influence how much, um, for example, maybe arrogance, confidence, charm. And so, for example, this person who convinced how many busload of journalists that they had their own party, which they didn't, and so on and so forth, these things like lying and confidence, arrogance, actually inform um, in a way which, 
would probably not change the current status quo if you see what I mean so it's like the most I think there was a comedian who said it's like the most damaging um forms of capitalism is actually driven by psychopathy for example and so a lot of the radical ideas that can come out would generally be picked up because someone speaks about them in such a hmm. Man. Yes. Well, didn't John Ronson write the book about the psychopath test where he basically said that um, people who are um, sort of in leadership positions, including MPs, have to be mildly sociopathic, really, to believe that everyone else should listen to them and do what they say. Uh, so you have this self-selection problem, which basically means all of our elected members are psychopaths by virtue of becoming that. And well, I mean, I, w I would, I, yeah, I do think that nearly everyone in the group, that I saw, all the leaders that I, I, mean, I and I tried to find obviously groups where there were no leaders that were hierarch hierarchy free, flat organizations, which is one of the biggest myths you'll ever hear because there's always a leader. And in the end, when you don't have hierarchies, their, their p possible power is completely unconstrained and it's not clear who's in charge. And, and so I. I Every time we try and recreate these beautiful flat organisations, I've never actually seen it work. The, the actually, weirdly enough, the, the Free Love Commune kind of had some ways of trying to deal with that. And they were trying to reject exactly what you were you're, you're saying. But everyone that I met who was leader was had a massive ego. I mean, really, like, they were obsessive personalities. They would go to unbelievable lengths. They work 16 hours a day. They're unbelievably charismatic. Tommy Robinson is incredibly charismatic. Uh, Vit Jedlicka, who runs Liberland, works 15 hours a day. He's unbelievably funny. He's really interesting. He believes so strongly in his ideas. And there is a danger with that because that is where you get the kind of dogmatic extremism. And that's the flip side of the power of radicalism which is that people that are sufficiently motivated to put all of this work in do tend to become slightly closed to other arguments. And I had this exchange with a crypto anarchist over in Prague, and, and we were talking about crypto anarchy, so this kind of radical libertarian thinking twinned with technology. And he goes to me, this is what I don't understand, Jamie, right? You seem to understand crypto anarchy. And I said, yeah, I do. I think I, I, think I get it. And he said... But but you but you said you're not a crypto anarchist, and I said no, I'm not. And he said, well, how's that possible? <laughs> and, and and I kind of saw that in every single group. It's like which which does lead you to then if to your opponents you start saying, well, you're a, you're an idiot because you don't get what's obviously true, or you're part of some kind of government. You're a government shill or a cons you know you're part you know you're part of the mainstream media who's trying to do us down. So there is that there is an inherent danger that the sort of people that push society forward with these radical ideas generally are quite egotistical, charismatic, and that has its own problems. Probably this is a, we, there is a question one more about question. which is a question that I fear because I know who this is and he's just gonna lay this, some is this Vinay? unbelievably complicated shit on me. <laughs> this is what he does. I know him. The, dude, the mic, I don't think the mic. Okay. Okay. No, I just shout. <laughs> so, ah, right. sorry about that. So it's a fairly simple question, uh, which is, we, we talked a little bit about the green terrorists. And well, I, I didn't call them terrorists well, on they, purpose. Well, they'll, they'll become terrorists. Well, <laughs> all right. Okay. Here we go. Could you not use that in the podcast? Oh, sure. Okay. Green, <laughs> green, uh, green. Uh, let's say violent extremists. Right. We we agree there's a potential for these people. What I want to ask is: Is there a potential that they could be effective? Right. So traditionally, terrorism has been very much about changing the minds of the public by committing atrocities which attract news attention. But in the case of a green terrorism, you could, for example, blow up oil infrastructure like the oil terminals. Uh, in much the same way that Sea Shepherd sunk the remainder of the Japanese whaling fleet. And if you're close enough to the end of the age of oil that you blow up the oil terminals, it's econ economically inefficient to rebuild them. So I wonder whether um, there's the possibility that you could see a genuinely effective violent environmental movement, or do you think it would be kind of bader showcase stuff? Are they thinking hard enough about this to be realistic, 
or is it largely just a fantasy of boys with guns? Um, oh God, I mean, any answer I give here will be quite contentious and controversial, but there's a book called um, Deep Green Resistance, and it was also a movement which basically argued for what you're saying, which is essentially politics won't deal with this problem. It's going to get worse. The climate change problem is going to get measurably and sort of uh, demonstrably worse. And at some point, the morally right thing to do will be to conduct acts of militant direct action. So not killing people, but industrial espionage. So monkey wrenching, but on a massive scale, blowing up oil tankers, whatever else you can do. Um, and that is the kind of the possible route that this could take. It's, it is it is possible. Like, judge, looking at other ways that radicalization occurs, this ha this could happen. And I think it's going to be morally very difficult for people to piece th to work out what they think about this, because they will say, "Well, these guys are trying to not kill innocent people. They're trying to save the planet. How do we feel about that?" It'll be very confusing. And it'll be quite divisive, and there'll be a big pushback from the establishment about these guys are terrorists. And a lot of people say, well, I don't actually think they really are terrorists. I think they're actually trying to do something good. And it, it will be more than Bader Meinhof, I think. I know Bader Meinhof claimed they were doing it for the emancipation of everybody as well and the emancipation from the capitalist system. But I think that's way more hypothetical than actually saving the planet. And I think there is a possibility that it could be more effective than other forms. I mean, if you we shut down, in my book, we shut down... Fossi Fran. These guys weren't really militant in the same way. This was, just, this was just classic direct action. We just invaded the mine, chained ourselves to the machinery, and shut it down for the day. And that was fine. No one got arrested. And we could have got arrested for criminal damage, I suppose, but we, no one got arrested. But it was very effective. It only took 500 people. We could have done it with 100 people. And we shut down a whole mine for a day. If 10,000 people were doing this, you could shut down every mine in the country every day. And you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to stop it. So it could happen, and it would be more effective, and it would force governments to reconsider their policy. I just hope we don't get to that because I think it's going to be really, really an awful lot of clashes before we reach that point. But I think the reason that it could happen is what you're saying that it might actually be effective. It might actually result in change. And I fear that a lot of direct action militant environmentalists will come to the conclusion that it would work. And more and more peaceful, you know, protesting and waving banners just won't work. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Because I've spoken to a lot of environmentalists who have said the opposite. Like because these because these like more violent uh, most of the anti fracking movement have, have come in, they've kind of like now the police are like being more aggressive, for instance. But I think everything that you're you're speaking to is, is the prevent strategy essentially, or any sort of like um, Western countries um, anti terror legislation that loops all these environmentalists into like what is the economic security of the country. Yeah, that wor that worries me. That worries me. We'll we'll throw them all in. We'll stick them on the 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 counter terrorism prevent strategy, and these people are going to be like, "What are you going to do? Get like someone from Greenpeace to talk me down?" I mean, how's it going to work? Did, did, did so, you find that though in the, in the environmentalists you hung out with that there were there was almost a split and divide, yeah. Between, yeah, the, divide between the um between the sort of violent ones who are like this isn't working we need your action and ones that have like more working with the police in term in in terms of like slowing down building and, and you know working within the law I guess yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And every single movement I was with has that same split. Mm. They all have that split. Should you work peacefully and slowly and within the bounds of the law or to really affect change, you need to go outside of it. And that, that offshooting is found in radical Islamist movements as well who say, oh, we can peacefully affect change through, you know, uh, you know, militating for radical Islam peacefully. And those who say, that's never going to work, you're just a... And, and, they'll, and, they'll, and they'll branch off, and that creates its own social dynamic where they start turning against each other, and, each, and the violent ones get more and more violent because there's a social dynamic within that group to egg each other on. And that is what could happen. But I say all of this non-judgmentally. I'm trying not to say... 
And so there's a bunch of nutters, terrorists, and we've got to crack down. I think it's way more complicated than that. And I, so I don't want to discredit them all by using the T word, because I think that's maybe the wrong way of thinking about this. I think especially for the far right as well, when we when we lump when we lump these very different groups into sort of one, you know, neo-Nazi or white supremacist area, that then that that also sort of like puts this field towards extremism or radicalization. And I liked what Luke made the point about violence as well, because I've spoken to many right groups who say that they have, you know, young kids come to them who want really like violent action. And they're like, what are, what are they supposed to do? They're just, you know, living day to day with a far right ideology, not, wa- not wanting to have violence. And yet they get these people coming in and they have this responsibility all of a sudden to, to deal with these more extremist views. The one thing that ties together every single sort of violent extremist group is that it's nearly always 16 to 30 year old men. Like we always layer on the ideology on top of it, but there is a quite a common theme across all of them. And it's young men nearly always that want to push the violent bit of it. Oh, I wonder why that is. And we never, you know, and we never, well, we never talk about that side of it. It's always obsessing over the ideology or the particular thing. And there's, there's about Nazi stuff. Like, what, what worries me and what I try to flesh out in this book a little bit is if you call everyone a Nazi, then no one's a Nazi. So we go around calling UKIP people Nazi or even Tommy Robinson a Nazi or a fascist. And then in the end, the actual fascists, people that actually believe in the use of violence to overthrow democracy or whatever, or who are truly white supremacists, mm. That word loses its power because we've spent all of our energy calling the English Defence League fascists and they're not. Or the fact that we don't have like a, a space to culturally critique what actually their ideologies are. The fact that we just dismiss it all the time means that young people don't have anywhere to turn to. And so they end up being in the most extremist sort of like plot violence or whatever because there's there's no there's no content out there that they can digest and be like oh you know what 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 this like you know strange facebook post that i've gotten there, there's no one out there critiquing because it's always like no not see this not but, see but, that but can i can i say one one other quick thing sorry look sorry so one thing, which is um like violence and struggle has its own uh, inherent appeal like the idea of glory and excitement and battling and fighting for a bigger ideal. It's so appealing to people, especially when you feel like you're like... that's why everyone's here, really. Well, but yeah, it's like, but, 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 but life feels like it might be reduced, reduced to checking your phone and like boring, tedious call center jobs in a town where not much is going on. And suddenly you become part, you can become part of a movement which is struggling for some great survival of Europe and Western democracy and you're fighting, you're struggling and you're clashing with the police. And it, we, we don't have many like peaceful, exciting opportunities for young men to engage in this kind of desire for honor and adventure. Well, not just young men, anyone for honor and adventure and excitement. And people turn to these movements because it offers them that. And we need to come up with other ways of giving people that. I'll just ask one more question regarding can we have like the can we have technology free of political ideology because I feel like many of these extremist groups that I've spoken to have like such fascinating ideas when it comes to whether how we protect ourselves in a surveillance matter to how we rebuild decentralize the internet but all these people are on the fringes of society and how do we bring this and how how do we bring these technology ideas into into Silicon Valley, or oh, that's too oh, that's too big of a question. I mean, I I, I struggled to answer it already with the woman at the back from the alternative, you know, because that I mean that that is the question how you how you bring some of those in. But like I said, I mean, change happens incredibly quickly. Stuff like Ethereum, whether you think it's good or not, or blockchain, I mean, the speed with which that has come up and just turned things around, everyone's excited by. It. It's like four or five years. It's less, three years. Bitcoin, five years. Things are happening very quickly and we're quite impatient with change. We kind of want it to happen immediately. But when you look over the grand scheme of time, things are happening unbelievably quickly. So, you know, maybe we need just a little bit more patience. So I I think there's something in media as well. So I think culture jamming and the artists such as the folks like the Yes Men who are able to do these, not 
so far as violent interventions, but able to make interventions that actually affect things at a macro scale, such as affect a company's stock price overnight very quickly and using the same tools of the media that your radicals are using. I think there might be something in that. I think we need to get more creative rather than get more violent. And that's about as positive as I'm going to get. So on that note, I'm going to say... Thank you uh, to the Library Club for hosting us. Uh, we're excited to continue our relationship with the, uh, the venue here. We also host events at a hospital club. But if you want to find out, I'm going to kill that mic. If you want to find out more about uh, what we're doing, you can find us at Virtual Futures almost anywhere on the web. I want to thank the volunteers that, for helping us tonight, for running the mic and and running the uh, the cameras. And we've just launched a podcast over the summer, which is available on Apple Podcasts, Stitches, and SoundCloud, and all good podcasting apps and as we were talking right now they've just relaunched a new iPhone if anybody knows anything about what's just happened um, apparently uh, an iPhone X has been re uh, launched and uh, this week's episode is actually going to be with Jack Quee who's one of the leading researchers on something called eye slavery um, basically looking at the uh, 1.4 million people who are building those iPhones at Foxconn in in uh, parts of China. And um, what's quite interesting about Jack is he doesn't believe that automation is going to be the solution to that problem. He actually thinks we're going to continue employing individuals to make these devices because of that massively quick turnover. So this is Virtual Futures, and as such, I have to end with this warning, and that warning is this. The future is always virtual, and some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future isn't predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that today. Please join me in thanking the incredible Jamie Bartlett. The bar is now open. Thank you.